Yes, welcome to the No State Project live from my fortified compound here in Mesa, Arizona. If I get it right, I think it's December 18th, 2019. Actually, quite a day today. It is impeachment day. Uh, so it looks like uh, finally uh, somebody who has had no accountability his entire life, all 73 years, never being held accountable for a damn thing he's ever done, like grabbing women by the, uh, by, by the crotch. Uh, well, he may never not see prison because of this, but he's getting impeached. So all those stupid memes about uh, uh, all the all the blustering that no one's ever going to hold the man accountable. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's at least going to be the third president in American history to be impeached. So uh, that's always that that is a good thing. It is impeachment day. So happy impeachment day, everybody. We'll talk more about that, I guess, on the Saturday show. But I do appreciate everyone uh, supporting the show. If you want to help support the big show, it is uh, MarkStevens.net and MarkStevens.Sells.com. Start getting people actually filing in here. Uh, I, I guess uh, you know, they didn't know what I was talking about to then back out. So uh, nobody wants to hear about impeachment day. All right. I, I understand. I got a lot of stuff to get to today. Uh, oh, I forgot to put the number into the uh, chat. So if somebody can do that for me, if you want to join me here on the big show, it's 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. The passcode is 2020 with the pound sign or the hashtag. And that'll get you in. You can also reach me on Skype. It is Frank Rizzo 3. Frank Rizzo with the number 3. Instant message me first. I will routinely check uh, my uh, my Skype to see if I get a notification over there. Actually, uh, did the call yesterday, and I oh thanks verbal. Uh, we'll get that up there. Um, kind of disturbing, you know I. Critics, they come and go, and then occasionally you get these that just like a thorn in your behind. They just, you just can't, you know, like if you're a fat guy, you just, you just can't seem to get it. And, and it just, it's, it's there. And it's just a part of doing, you know, doing anything publicly. And uh, I don't mind having critics. I don't mind dissent. In fact, if, if you disagree with what I say on the show, I would say you're more than happy. And, and, and the idea that uh, you're not good at public speaking. Well, as long as you can pick up the phone and have a conversation, that's all that's required to join me. Uh, you're, it, this is this is YouTube. I don't have a very large platform. Uh, it's not a big channel, so I really don't buy this this thing. Well, I'm not good at public speaking. Well, can you use a phone? You're just having a conversation with a regular guy. Whatever "regular" is supposed to mean today, but um, but when critics lie. When there are lies about you, you probably should respond to those. And that's why certain people, you know, why one of my yardsticks is for, for blocking somebody on my channel or on my website, my forum. If, if you lie about my work and I've pointed out and I've corrected you and you, and you continue to lie, well, that's not dissent. That's just, and I don't have, you know, again, you can call the show and, you know, it, 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 I don't block in. Well, I'll get to blocking people from the show. But consistently lying about my work and I'm going to go through this. I just actually, you know, I, so I, I went through and, and against my best judgment and I had another conversation with Juan Gold and I, I just, I, I, I wanted to get something up quickly because just in the first two minutes you can see how the rest of the conversation is going to go with this guy he doesn't lie about something big he lies about something really small and you, you gotta wonder why would he lie about that so i put the video up and i have in the thumbnail and i have in the actual video is Juan Gold lying or does he just have a bad memory? Now, I made reference to the bad memory on, on the call yesterday because uh, from what he, he did say, he is a, quite a bit older than me. And uh, hey, and I'm not 30 years old anymore. So uh, I guess we you can see that there. So um, but he 
look, I thought the whole thing was going to be a waste of time, but I, I figured I would do it because I didn't want anyone thinking that I backed down from criticism because I, I don't. And, and now we've got even more evidence to that. Now, I shouldn't. I've got enough evidence that I shouldn't have to defend. So I, I probably shouldn't have done the call at all. But turns out I got some really good evidence to that people can make up their own mind just how damn dishonest this guy is. So if you if you after the show, you can go. It's, it's only two minutes long. And and I didn't because I didn't want to waste time. I wanted to know if he was just going to give me the same tired argument that I've heard for years and I've addressed it hundreds of times. I may not be addressing him directly, but he does have somebody who keeps parroting the same exact, I, that this one, you know, we all know who it is and they don't have an original argument. Not that that's really something to rail against. It's, but it's the same arguments that Juan Galt puts forth. There's nothing original there. It's Juan Galt does it. And they just Juan Galt. Well, Juan Galt said, and I asked him if we were going to be covering any new ground or is it the same argument? Well, he denied multiple times and I gave him three or four opportunities to tell the truth. And each time he denied that we had ever, he had ever made that argument with me publicly. Well, you can, you can see in the video and I will post the entire video with, with the unedited audio. I will do that. I, I did a private stream in, as I was doing the conversation with him. So if I'm accused of editing, which I think we all know here, I'm no editor. But if I am falsely accused of editing to make it look bad, I will re I will release, you know, I, all I have to do is just one little thing. I, I go from, from private to public. You can get the entire stream unedited. But he... I have the documentation I have right from the forum that this is a very old argument that he has presented. Now, I didn't, now I'm not going to go through and get every single example from the forum. I provide the link and everybody can look for themselves. You look for yourself. So, yeah, all right. Let, uh, you, uh, Cop Block Hot Springs is saying, you demonstrating Juan Galt is stupid equals priceless. Having to listen to Juan himself torture. <laughs> I, I had to listen to him for 40 minutes. So it is, it, it is brutal speaking to him. Now, the dishonesty yesterday and, and lying, saying that I didn't answer his questions. That's bad. That, that's indicative of, of, uh, of somebody, you know, and their motive. It goes to them as a personality. So you have to ask yourself, why is somebody who's one of the most successful lawyers, apparently, who graduated Yale Law School, I believe that's what we said, Yale Law School, in his late 60s, early 70s, who had this unbelievably successful career. Why would they hang on the words of, 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 of someone from Long Island who averages a thousand views? Why hang on my words? What motivates him? Why would someone so wealthy focus so much attention on me for years, nonstop for years? Ah, is he really a, a Harvard law grad? I mean, a Yale law grad? Is he really who he says? I don't know. I, it, to me, it, does, it, it just doesn't add up why I'm such a focus of this guy. So it's one thing to lie. And, and, and everybody can make up their own mind. I think the guy's dishonest as the day is long, and I've got the evidence to prove it. So you you can either accept the evidence or not. I, I'm sure we're going to have our resident troll here who's going to say, "I'm taking it out of context," or that you know that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how 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 many times he lies. But what I saw, thank you, Stahl. What I had to see on Skype, again, Stahl pointed this out. It's one thing, lying is bad enough. But you really want to get into the mindset of how, how uh, of this guy's mind. He posted a video of a tragedy. Something that affected me deeply. And I talked about it on the show, and I didn't really give many details. All just that an innocent woman was killed, murdered. 
And this guy, in an effort to discredit me, posts a video saying, a woman shot by barricaded gunmen in St. Clair Shores describes terror. And this, of course, is Tom. And the title of the video is Mark Stevens, in all caps, his devout follower and student. This is a level of depravity in order to discredit me that has to be obvious to even someone who supports him that this is crossing a line. This is absolutely despicable. It doesn't matter that he was blocked from the show several times. It doesn't matter that I butted heads with him on almost every subject other than a very limited scope about court procedure. Everything else I pretty much disagree with the guy on, and he was banned for being a racist prick. And to try to somehow draw a line between Tom's murderous rampage, murderous racist rampage, and somehow draw a connection to me, says more about this character, Juan Galt, than it does me. This is disgraceful. What Tom did had nothing to do based on what he learned from me. But this is the level that this man will go to. Mark Stevens, his devout follower and student. No. Yeah, he called a show. You're going to find that I'm somehow responsible for his murderous, racist rampage because he called into my show? And you call yourself a brilliant, that you're this, this fantastic lawyer? Is that what your law school education does? So if you have a client who's convicted of possessing child pornography, does that mean he, that that somehow is, 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 is an indictment against you? This is absolutely beyond the pale. And this is what you expect from someone like Juan Galt. This is absolutely disgraceful. Yeah, someone's saying here a typical uh, scumbag lawyer. Now I'm not going to. I'm not going to. You know, in, I'll, I'll describe the behavior, but I'm not going to insult him like he does to me. This is the level. You're that desperate to discredit me that you'll pull something out that this massive non sequitur. Now, to anybody listening to the show, and you go back in the archives, you can hear that I disagree with him, and even cut him off the show, and even blocked him a few times. Yeah, it was probably poor judgment because he he sobered up and wasn't discussing that stuff again. But then when he got back into it, I disagree with it. So this is this is your hero, our, our resident troll. I don't see them here now. See them justify that. And at least some people look like they were trying to call him out. Of, hey, I'm just putting it up there. You can make up your own mind. Yeah, that's really honest. So aside from the disgusting dishonesty that he exhibited in that 40-minute call, which I will get the whole thing posted, he actually goes out and tries to say and draw some kind of relationship there between me and, and a caller to the show. Unbelievable. Uh, disgraceful. Just absolutely despicable behavior. And that's enough on that. I, 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 I just... I, I I can't even begin to fathom the, dis the 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 hatred somebody has for me that instead of just addressing the damn argument and being honest, he does something like this. And so that's what you what will hear in the call tomorrow. I answer his questions, and he lies and says says that I didn't. And yet through the entire call, he doesn't answer the questions. He's condescending. Uh, he's arrogant. And a typical tactic that this lawyer has. That's why he may actually be a lawyer. Well, I'll give him that. He may actually be a lawyer. So verbal arm, Juan is infatuated with you. Well, it, it, I don't know if it's infatuation, but it's certainly a, um, he's obsessed. This is unhealthy. I mean, you got people like Wes Sarah, where he'll do a drive-by. He doesn't focus his entire adult life in retirement with all his money, Wes Sarah, he doesn't like me. He disagrees with me, but he's, he doesn't comment incessantly. He doesn't have someone posting his same arguments on every single show. So I would say it's more of an obsession and infatuation. So 
you know, we can, if, if he is a lawyer, he's employing a very standard lawyer trick. So uh, let me talk about that. You ask him a question directly and the question requires a yes or no answer. And it's not that I'm demanding a yes or no answer, but that's common courtesy. That's when you're speaking to somebody and they ask you a yes or no question, the common courtesy there, the the, the most basic social aspect is to answer the question. We're having a discussion on a particular legal issue. And when you ask a question, look, yes or no, it, you know, and you go into a discourse. So that's what Juan does. So when you ask him a question directly, he won't answer you. He'll go into a long discourse. So an example is I asked him, would it be fair for the prosecution to make an argument, a claim that I can't challenge? So instead of answering the question, he rambles on about me that I can challenge it. I'm like, that's not the question. The question is, is it fair if I'm not allowed to do that? Oh, but you can challenge. Uh, that's not the question. So instead of answering the question directly so that it advances the argument, so it advances the discussion, he goes into a discourse. So it makes it sound like he's answering the question, but he's not. And so... This is one of the dishonest tactics that he uses. So we have another 40-minute audio evidence showing very clearly Juan Galt, when asked a direct question, typically doesn't answer. So then he'll say that I just didn't understand. Well, the question respond the question required a yes or no. That's what I'm looking for. It's not that I didn't understand what you said, it's you're not being responsive. And it, it's that same thing tactic that bureaucrats use when they say, well, nothing I say will convince you. Uh, well, look, I didn't say that you were retarded. Don't give me a backhanded, uh, uh, you know, insult either. Okay. Extend me the same courtesy. And one of the things I realized was that if I can't worry so much about this and I can't just keep responding to his, the same claim over and over and over and over again. And then it hit me that if there are people going on the internet here and they're looking at my videos and they're looking at Juan Galt's, if, if people can't see through his tactics, if you can't see that he's not addressing the issue, if you can't see he's cherry picking, if you can't see that he's making a bad argument, if you can't see he's lying, then you really aren't somebody who should put their life in further jeopardy and try to defend yourself in court. Because one of the, one of the prerequisites here is you have to be able to recognize a bad argument when you hear it. Uh, that that's, you know, someone saying deflection is not good. So why do you do it? Mark, uh, where am I deflecting anything? Uh, call the show and give me an, or, or put it in the chat in, in the chat there exactly where I'm deflecting something with Juan Gall. Well, someone's saying 12 dozen, don't let him get to you too much. What gets to me is, is not just, not that he lied. I, I you know, uh, okay. I get that and I accept it. That's just the way he is. What gets to me though. And, and I think this would affect anybody is when he's trying to draw some kind of correlation, uh, uh, causation between me and Tom's uh, murderous racist rampage. That is just that. And, and so it, like I, I mentioned before, 12, it gets to this idea why, you know, that, 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 that there are some people that are just obsessed and, and to a point of it's just creepy and, and the desperation and to know that there's somebody that hates you to such a degree and, and, and dislikes your work so much that in their obsession to discredit you, instead of just addressing the argument head on, they smear you like this. So anybody who's out there saying, oh, don't take it so serious, or don't take it, you not, to have that done to you publicly, especially when it involves somebody that you worked with, and I'm talking about the murder victim here, not just Tom, or not, okay, that, that, that's just a level of, uh, that's really just so, uh, that's so, yeah, you don't have to be subbed to his channel to watch the videos. So again, anybody who's watching the video, if they can't see through his argument, it's not somebody that should be defending themselves in court 
anyway. These people, you know, people like that, for whatever reason, you got to have a lawyer because you can't speak for yourself because you can't recognize the, a bad argument. And um, I, 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 you know, I'm not saying I'm the best at it, but I think I got a pretty good track record. And I think when you hear another conversation with him, you'll recognize and you'll you'll hear what happens when you have someone who's dishonest like Juan Gall and you're trying to get the, you know, move the discussion. If you're, if you don't accept his non-responsive answers and you, you, now I wouldn't say insist, but you, uh, you ask for a responsive yes or no, uh, you'll hear what happens. He gets enraged. So it, it's similar to with bureaucrats. And before I go to a call, I, I want to point out, and this is something that he would not address yesterday. What I do and what I recommend, what, what I recommend, like in, if I'm in that situation, so if people are calling and with, you know, for how they should defend themselves and I start talking about tools and I'm not saying to do this or not do that, except make your court dates on time. I go and I explain the reason why we're doing this is because we're saying the process isn't fair. That that's the basis. That's that that's the okay. So one of the things I mentioned on the uh, on the call yesterday was, uh, it's not fair that it uh, that to quote the Supreme Court, it offends traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice. So that's a broad statement. So if there's not something spelled out in a court case that is that 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 it's unfair, but it happens and and you can get the judge to agree that yes, this is unfair. You got yourself a due process violation. So if you can show that it offends traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice, yeah, you got yourself a, a due process violation, which it says you suppose you know, due process it's, it's fundamental fairness. And as I've mentioned in other videos, we're looking at it from a standpoint of a skeptic. That what's important is that we're not going to be judging the actions of the organization. Uh, whether they're right or wrong or fair or unfair, using just the lens of their rules. Now, that's not something that Juan wants to accept. I was I still spoke for 40 minutes. But this is why I do what I'm doing. Because it's fundamentally unfair. Not that it's necessarily spelled out like a denial of, dupe, uh, a, denial of effect of cross. But it's unfair, and that is by showing that you can't challenge certain things, or uh, uh, the prosecutor is able to make a claim, a foundational claim, and you without evidence, and you can't do that either. So uh, that's the basis of what I do. That's that underlies really all of it, and to not want to discuss that in the context of whether the proceeding is fair or not, I I think that's disingenuous. But uh, that's his, you know, he, his argument is we can only look at it through their rules. And I disagree with that. And I explained why that even if you say it is by, we can even say it's by their rules. Cause it's, again, it offends traditional notions of, of fair play and substantial justice because it's not fair. And that, so that's not something he wanted to get into. And I understand you can't maintain your position. Uh, he can't maintain his argument otherwise. So what you do is you deflect and you just, dance around the issue and you make it sound like you're answering, but you're not. So that's why I recommend when you're going into court, you always want to use leading questions. And one of the best parts about that, in my view, for us lay people, is it makes it easy for us to know whether we're getting a responsive answer or not. It's just yes or no. And um, now some questions, you know, like I, I objected to the to the substance of the question, and I told them that, and we had a discussion. I didn't just make it try. Oh, I don't like this question; it makes my argument look really bad. So I'm just going to go into a legal di discourse, and I'm going to make it look like I no. So uh, I'll get to the call here. Just please know that it's very important for us to be looking at this as a skeptic, and that everything they're saying is a lie, and we have to understand basic. Uh, logic so that we can understand or recognize when somebody's making a bad argument. That's that is critically important. And if you cannot recognize a bad argument, 
you're not going to be able to effectively defend yourself. I, I That's just the way I see things. You know, I mean, some lawyer may say, well, no, you can you don't have to have any argument skills at all and you can still be successful in court arguing. I, that, it's just not a position that I'm willing to take because it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, see if we get sense of things here. We got area code three, two, one. You're live on the No State Project. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Mark, it's Paul here in Florida. Paul in Florida. How you doing today? Doing well. Last week was my was my trial. I I told you I got the ju- judge to admit that she didn't have jurisdiction or that she was assuming jurisdiction. Right. Um. So I again, she admitted that we went through the you know we went through the sham of the trial, and you know she still found me guilty, of course. What is the, I guess, what's the process for appeal if I want to do it? Um, how I, I, I'm not really familiar with it. So, hello. Oh, that was my fault. Uh, before we get into the details of what happened, because I want to know what led up to that so we can talk about possible appealable issues, if you even have any, so uh, we don't know yet. Um, uh, uh, to get it started, all you do is a notice of appeal. It's, it's So for those listening, it is just a notice. All you're saying is that uh, after being found guilty in the, the justice court, appeal is taken to the superior. You know, th- that's all it is. There's no argument in a notice of appeal. Uh, so now that we've got that out of the way, and I can get, send you a, a template for that. Uh, you also have what's called post conviction relief. It, if it was criminal and I'm happy to send you a template for that also, but give us some of the details so that we can determine, uh, if you have any appealable issues. Okay. So this, and again, you, you and I had gone back and forth several times with email just last week. I filed that writ of mandamus you gave me, but I filed it only two days in advance, so it never got processed in time to take effect, so I couldn't issue a summons to the judge. But this has been ongoing. It was a so-called driving without a license. It was almost two years. I got um, the first two judges to recuse themselves, and this judge would not recuse herself. And so we ended up going to trial. Um, I don't know how much detail you want. You did have some of the details in the emails we went back and forth with. Uh, yeah, but we're live on the show. And so people can under, you know, know, you know, the, I, I like, you know, okay. everybody need, you know, would like, you know, should be able to hear. Um, well, I mean, in this lat, in this, in this la- uh, latest trial last week, I basically just stuck to stuck to your, your basics. I kept going back and a- back and forth. Cause again, they never give you a straight answer. So when I, when I asked if, um, if the law, you know, where is there evidence that the law applied to me, even when I got, well, yeah, I can go through what I did when the, when I was questioning the, the police officer, when he was on the stand, but, um, I started the, I started the trial by objecting because I had not entered a plea. And I said, did I enter a plea? When did that happen? And, um, and again, I never really got an answer there. And so I said, I object for, for, you know, I don't want to proceed. She said, "We're well, proceeding anyhow, of course." Well, um, you didn't give and a reason. Then I well, asked the I'm, question again. I'm sorry, but you probably you got to when you make an objection, you got to give a reason uh, other than I don't want to proceed. You got to give a reason why. I mean, the reason could be the prosecution hasn't met their prima facie burden to prove personal and subject matter jurisdiction. And I, I do want to point out, we're I, not going into court and saying. Is there evidence the laws apply? We want to say, does the prosecution have evidence to support their claim that the laws apply just because I'm physically in Florida? So remember, that's you. you it's not making it some kind of magical that's all going to go away, but we have to frame our question correctly in order to get the right answer. And if we're not framing the question right, then they can argue that you know, hey, you know, the way he, you know, look, that's what lawyers do. Just like remember Bill Clinton, it depends on what the definition of is, is. And, uh, and so that's why we want to be very precise in our language, in our, in our objection, in our question. So again, it is not, does the prosecution have evidence proven the laws apply? It's does the prosecution have evidence to support their claim or their allegation that they do just because I'm in uh, Florida? 
Got it. And I probably asked it both ways several different times. When I when I get, when I pay for the tape, I will send you a copy of it so you can you have something to go by and you can critique it and you can help other people with it. Um, and so we ended up uh, proceeding. The um, I did again. I did something a little bit different just because I want at this point I knew it wasn't going to be in my favor, but I had already pulled the, um, when the cop got up on the stand, I did object one time, um, cause he said something that didn't occur. And I said, objection. And the judge said, why? And I said, because he's lying. And she said, no, you can just re-question him when he, when it's your turn. It's like, okay, fine. Um, yeah. Well, but, did you, um, did you object to the when, witness being put when, on the stand because there was a lack of proof? Showing that they have personal knowledge of the matters. I which did. Has to, okay. And what happened with that? When they called him to the stand, I said she overruled it. Just, okay. Again, didn't even, didn't even, you know, phase her. Yep. Okay. Did you have any um, objections? So I think there's some appealable issues in here. Well, that's, yeah, I would say that that's an appealable issue. Now they could argue. And I, I think I, I know what's going to, you know, what's going to, what you're going to say, cause it, it, it's pr fairly standard. Uh, but uh, they could argue, well, he had every opportunity to bring out a lack of personal knowledge on cross. So, did that happen on cross? Did they object to a question saying that it requires a legal conclusion and the witness isn't qualified to testify? Did did you go through that scenario? Yes, I actually, so I, I actually, I also entered a piece of evidence myself. I entered his oath of office and I tried to go down a line of question if he knew what um, ah, come on, protect Paul. and defend the constitution met. <laughs> and um, that didn't go very far. I got the prosecutor to object that it was irrelative um, irrelevant yeah well it was it was interesting introducing well it, it really um, isn't something that we want to raise though paul i mean you know that now and what's that it's not something we yeah, should know be, yeah. Uh, yeah well all right so just so we we have this because you know we're going to talk about appealable issues so you asked the police officer you determined on your own just because i was physically in in florida that your your laws applied and uh i gave you jurisdiction to stop me and ticket me so you asked him that i i did i asked him it in a different way because the prosecution had entered into the um entered into evidence their uh copy of my driving record and she showed it to me and it's again i didn't know if i was supposed to object it was my driving record so it's not like i you know it's like fine and i used i showed the police officer and i asked him um can you please show me where on this in, in this evidence that it shows that the laws that the the, the laws apply to me okay and he, was, he was shaking his head no on the stand when i got the objection from the prosecutor okay well hold on hold that thought now I've always said we we want to object often <laughs> to pretty much everything, and that uh, for something here, relevance. The only thing that gets that document entered is relevance. It's a very low standard. Oh, I know, I know, I don't understand that, but it's a very low standard. If there's any any probability to prove the proposition, does the driving record prove the proposition that the laws apply because you're physically in Florida, which is the foundation of the prosecution's case? Does that driving record have any tendency to prove that proposition or that claim? No. Okay. Then it's not relevant. And that's how I, why I would object. Objection, no relevance to the prosecution's claim that just because I'm in Florida, the constitutional laws apply giving jurisdiction. Now, because remember, the cop is testifying that the laws applied and you violated them. And before uh, we haven't had the, the, the displeasure, uh, you know, the thing is, uh, remember, when we say the law, the Constitution, the Florida State Constitution is a law. OK, so it is a law that okay, so it's included in that. That's why I say that. OK, so uh, to get back or right, so that's way I how I would object. Uh, OK, so. Uh, so you're going to so now you're talking to the police officer and you ask him what facts his decision was based on that just because you were physically in Florida, the laws apply. And what was the prosecution's objection? Objection. Uh, I can't remember if it was irrelative or. Oh, no, she she said basically what you said, that he um, he wasn't qualified. And I asked that the that the witness basically be uh, disqualified. 
But, but what was and the process? Again, the but, it. but did the prosecution say objection calls for legal conclusion? The witness is not qualified to testify. No, they did not exactly say that. I can't remember the exact wording. It was not. It was not an not an exact phrase match, if you want to say. Um, it okay. was something different, but it was basically meant the same. It meant the same thing. So they would basically what what the objection was is the witness wasn't qualified, and the judge sustained it. Correct. What did and okay? So what did you do after that? How did you address that nonsense? Um, I can't remember. I have to go. I'd have to go back. Um, the. It wasn't. It didn't last too much longer after that. Though one of the, and again, this is this is necessarily um, relative, but it was it was kind of interesting and kind of entertaining. The um, prosecutor. This shows you how much lack of actual r real work they do. She probably took five minutes on three different occasions trying to introduce, going back and trying to enter. The judge kept correcting her, saying, "No, you can't. You have not done." You know, you haven't entered the, the and again, I didn't know what to object to and what not to object to because I didn't have enough knowledge myself. But there's three separate incidents where she took at least five minutes trying to try and introduce evidence the wrong way. So that was kind of interesting. Um, oh. I did object saying the prosecution has had two months to prepare for this case, Judge. So but. Um, well, that's I'll basically it. Um, the one, one, one thing that was interesting she let me do a so-called closing statement. So I read, I basically, I didn't know I was going to be able to do that. So I wasn't prepared. I just read basically the, and the prosecutor did not like that because it had been so-called ruled on already. So, uh, well, um, why, don't, why don't we just take I got it, it into, I got it into the record. So, okay, well, let's just take a couple minutes here and we'll okay. discuss what the purpose is of an opening and closing statement, especially if the prosecutor is doing the opening statement. You can and should object if they're going because the, if they're going outside the bounds of a legitimate opening statement, the opening statement is uh, limited to just the facts and, and, and the allegations that you're going to prove that you're going to call so-and-so, they're going to prove this, and they're going to testify to that, and they're going to testify to this. You know, uh, when they go beyond those, go to Cousin Vinny, I, then you you know when they go outside of the bounds, when they're going to start arguing, uh, 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 well, the witness will testify, objection, witness, to, uh, just get it, you know. Uh, the same thing on close. The closing argument is limited to just the facts that have been proven. Do those facts prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt? Do they make, do these facts, if it taken as true, do they prove the proposition? And so here, what I would have done was point yeah. out that when I asked for the facts to support the police officer's claim that he made on the stop, there was an objection that was sustained without discussion. That is a classic denial of effect of cross-examination. To not allow the witness to testify to the facts regarding a, a, a claim or a decision that they made, that, that, that is black-letter law. That is the denial of effect of cross-examination. And that's what the close should be done. So if she is talking, he or she is talking about something that was not proven through the testimony, for example, that the laws apply and you violated them. It wasn't proven by testimony. Then you have to object. It may not change the judge's mind, but you still need to object so that you can raise the issue on appeal because the, 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 the judge should not be look that if, look, if it was fair, the judge would say, well, look, you can't argue on close something that's not in evidence. That's textbook prosecutorial misconduct i mean that's the 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 case the, the the roberts case that i quote so often that was a case where the prosecutor made arguments in the close that were not brought out in, on on uh, during a trial that's misconduct that's called right. in my book it's a felony yeah, and i think i did object to to some to somewhere in that closing argument i can't remember right now though so I'll have to listen to the to the audio that I did, um, but I was per, I I think that there were several um, times that several appealable issues uh, during this during this whole thing. So I guess I think so. If I send you the tape, is that something that you would 
you can listen to or uh, you'd have to give me the cliff notes to go with it but i would you know if if you want to pay for a consult that certainly would would help cover the time uh, you'd have to give me the cliff notes to go with it but i would you know if if you want to pay for a consult that certainly would would help cover the time i would say for right. you know just from what you're telling me uh if 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 the recording backs this which you know i'm going to take your word on just for 